Hi, I'm Jen Marr, founder and CEO of Inspiring Comfort and author of the book, Pause to Comfort. On today's show, we're gonna be talking about three things. We are first going to confront the myth of comfort. It is not a cozy word, but a very strong, resilient verb. Secondly, why you may have self-care backwards and why is it that when we care for others, it's the way we best care for ourselves. And lastly, we're gonna talk about what's actually stopping you from showing care. Uh, we know it's awkward, we know things have changed, but let's understand those behaviors and what you can do to break through that awkward zone so people around you really know that you care. Stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dolph Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dolph Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. Hey, would you do me a quick favor? Send me a note, DM me on any of the four big social media outlets, and tell us what platform you listen to us on. Is it Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, maybe it's one of the apps, whatever it is, please tell us. And you know what? Tell us what episode has been one of your favorites, because I'm going to pick a winner from all the people who write to me and uh, got a pretty decent prize for you. I think you're going to really enjoy it. So let me ask you, what do you need to do to up-level your leadership? Well, let's start here. What is comfort? Is it something that we should be including in leadership development? Is it part of that? Is it something we should pursue? Or is it something we should avoid? You know, we all know the problem with getting too comfortable, right? Um, but who wants to live their life in constant discomfort? No one. What's more, is there a place for comfort in the workplace uh, that's actually practical that could actually up-level your organization? Well, stay tuned because that's where we're going on today's show as we break open the myths of comfort. I'm Dov Barron. I'm your host. And I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action. Curious to know more? Simply go to DoveBarron.com. This episode of Leadership and Loyalty is brought to you in part by our other podcast, Curiosity Bites. Curiosity Bites is the answer to the question, how can we bring people together who completely disagree? This is exactly what your heart, your soul, your mind has been craving. It's your chance to sit in on some real and oftentimes intense conversations with some of the world's most interesting people. We're talking about astronauts philosophers, neuroscientists, neurosurgeons, holy people, quantum physicists, skeptics, Grammy award-winning entertainers, and so many more people who are just truly fascinating. Simply go to DoveBaron.com and find out how you can sign up for and sink your teeth in to the most delicious curiosity bites. As always, we need your help in promoting both of the shows, and we really need your help in letting people know. So if you can find both of the shows on all the usual outlets, and if you could just do us a favor, rate, review, and subscribe to the show, we'd really appreciate that. If you are a regular listener, big thank you to you for making us the number one podcast globally for Fortune 500 listeners, and we are honored and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast to make you a better leader. Again, thank you for sharing the show with everybody you know. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. Have you ever met someone who was getting a divorce and you asked them what was, you know, what happened? And they said something like, well, it's, we just got too comfortable. Comfort may be one of the great human paradoxes. We want it, we need it. But if we get too much of it, we can become demotivated and even lazy. 2020 and 2021 have been defined by political polarization and a global pandemic. No one has been untouched. We're all looking for some kind of comfort. So maybe we need to break open the myths we have around what comfort actually is by making a clear distinction between comforting and comfortable. So here's the question. Is there a specific way to deliver comfort to someone who is in massive distress 
and to do so in such a way that it's not only effective for that person, but it turns the entire organization up, makes us better. Well, let's find out together because our guest today is Jen Ma. She is the founder and CEO of Inspiring Comfort. She comes from a highly successful corporate background and found herself facilitating care and recovery efforts at the Sandy Hook after the, that mass shooting, which I, we're all familiar with. In an age of increasing social disconnection, she is disrupting the education and mental health spaces as she trains organizations, schools, and communities on how to activate the skill of comfort and cultivating a caring, connected culture. She has delivered her comfort skills program to such notable organizations as the Mental Health Association of New York State, the New York Office of Mental Health, the American Association of Suicide Prevention, Georgetown University, and Northeastern University. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and help me to welcome Jen Ma! <laughs> Jen. Wow, thank you. Good to have you with us. We're very excited to have you on today. I've been looking forward to our conversation. You know, and one of the things that I, I like to start the show with is by asking this question. As a consultant myself, as somebody who's often brought into uh, organizations, I'm asked to answer a question that's often the wrong question, so I'm going to come up with the wrong answer. So let me ask you, what do you see as the question that we've been ignoring or the question we're not asking in the context of leadership development that we should be asking? That is such a great question. Um, you know, Dav, I know you know this line. Everybody knows it. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. It's That's just true. human behavior. Yep. <laughs> so the question I think we should be asking is what's stopping us from showing care? Hmm. So that, that's, a, that's a great question. What's, what's stopping us from showing? Do you think it's sort of a social conditioning about what it means to be a leader? You know, because uh, particularly people in my age bracket, you know, if you, if you are a leader, you're supposed to be standoffish and, and, you know, not really let people in. And, you know, we have this whole issue with vulnerability. Is that why we're not showing we care? There's a, there's a lot of things we can unpack with this one, Dav, but let's just start with the societal changes that we have, mm -hmm. um, that we really do have to look generationally on the leaders of tomorrow and how different they are than the leaders of the past. Absolutely. And I think when we look at just how our society has changed, uh, even in the last just 15 years, we've gone from communicating face-to-face -to, -face to almost all screen-to-screen. -screen. Yes, that's We've true. had, it wasn't until 1970, 1980, um, that commercial air traffic came into play that has split our families. It used to be that you would drive as far as you could go for a job. Now, you know, the generations that graduated in the 80s, they flew. Yes. Um, families have begun to split apart. Uh, and not only that, with all of these new mental health challenges we're facing now, people, our social structure isn't the same. Our care system isn't the same. Our tribes are not the same. You know, in order to make it in life, you need a tribe of support. When your tribe has broken down, where do you go to for that tribe? So I think the leaders of the future are understanding that our whole society is different now. And mm -hmm. this, this saying of people don't care what you know until they know that you care has never been more relevant than it is today. And we can unpack data, we can unpack a whole bunch of stuff, but I think that's where it starts is understanding there's a reason, number one, why we need to show it more. And number two, why it's awkward if we're not, if we're communicating more screen to screen, our face-to-face -face behaviors, you know, and just think about this stuff, like probably 50 years ago, 30 years ago, even it used to be, you'd go to work, you'd go home, yep. you, you'd go to school and you'd go home. And that's not the case anymore. I mean, we've got from our surveys, there are some workplaces that we've surveyed over 35% of the people are going home and don't have a social support to fill their bucket. So if you've got if you've got over a third of your workforce coming in that don't have people to care for them outside of work and you don't care for them at work, 
those mm. people are lost. So again, that's where it starts is just- So they have no social, what, what's the word you use that? Um, it, is it just social support? Is that, I mean- because You would call it things, social connectedness, right? So, you yeah, would social call connectedness, it, because- you know, one of the things that's interesting for me is that millennials, when they are surveyed, say that, you know, th this is one of the things I love about millennials. They don't do the work-life balance. They do the work-life blend because they understand that many of their friends are people they work with. Mm -hmm. and, and if they, if there's nobody, when you go, when you leave the workspace, that's pretty devastating to mental health. And that's, I think, why we're seeing our mental health epidemic grow and grow and grow, especially with COVID. So, so, so let's look at this for a minute, because like I said at the beginning in the intro, I think that there's a, there's a myth around comfort. Uh, I think there's several myths actually around comfort. Um, uh, again, you know, we don't want to get too comfortable in a relationship. We get lazy. We know that about human beings. Um, you know, comfort, you know, I'm comfortable on the couch. <laughs> it's not going to help my heart much, but you know, so whatever it is. So help us unpack this whole thing around comfort because you, you talk about the verb versus the noun. So help us out. So, all right, let's go back. Whoever this marvelous word inventor was that came up with the word <laughs> comfort <laughs> came with Latin origins, right? C-O-M. Yes. C-O-M is the core to community, right? It means together with. Mm. or it means strength right that the the word was made as a resilient verb the word was never meant as a state of being um as much as it was we are stronger together it's the action of getting through our challenges together mm. um strength together is far more of a verb than it is a noun mm. but over the last centuries, it has taken on more of the noun form. It's what we hear more of now. Um, but when we're looking, you know, being out in the field where this all started, I didn't plan in my life to do this, as you know. Uh, it was that action that was needed because it's an action that is needed to offset the awkwardness and sometimes the kinds of training programs that were out there. Uh, you, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned I had um, spent a lot of time in the recovery efforts at Sandy Hook. It was true. And as part of the reason why I actually developed this was the programs out there weren't bringing connection where it was needed. You know, if you look at what happened in Sandy Hook, it's a town of 24,000 people. It was just absolutely horrifying what happened. But very good intentioned people wanted to help. So what did they do? They sent things. 67,000 teddy bears were sent to a town of 24,000 people. So people had good intentions, but they didn't act on those intentions well. And all of these things that were happening were not resulting in people feeling more cared for and connected. Um, these well-intentioned warehouses of stuff that were sent put an extra burden on this town. So these this kindness programs sometimes result in random acts that do not result in a connection. Um, mm. All of these teddy bears were random acts, right? Very good hearted people. Of course. Just went the wrong way. Or the other thing that we were finding in the field is um, emotional training programs. Again, these are all needed. Kindness programs are great. Emotional programs like empathy and compassion. Again, these are so needed and good. But what happens when you come face to face with someone Right. And this is really what we're going to dive into today is when you become when you come face to face with somebody that's struggling. Empathy programs that are mostly abstractly taught, maybe mm -hmm. some, a little role playing and perspective taking, but don't give you those concrete skills as to what to do when you're face to face with somebody don't end up resulting in connection because people they're like deer in the headlights. Mm -hmm. You know, you layer that on top of what's going on with our phones. I could share story after story, what it was like to be on the field with people with phones in their hand, having absolutely no idea what to say or do. And so the skill of comfort, I mean, you can't comfort someone without connecting with them. It just kind of, it just 
I fell into it as we were looking into it. We needed, we needed something more than empathy. People that sent those teddy bears had empathy in their hearts, but they acted on it wrong. There's also a lot of people that have empathy in their hearts, but they fail to act because they don't know what to do. And right. so it, we needed to fill this gap that was happening with concrete, actionable steps that people could actually do to show care to people around them. Um, and this has only become the more that I've studied it over these last years. Um, it's becoming more and more and more in need every single day. So people have are kind, they're empathetic, but they don't really know how to connect. And that's the missing piece. That's the, the, the glue, if you will, that brings it together. But a lot of people are feeling disconnected, um, certainly because of a pandemic that we've all been through. And also because of, as I mentioned in the introduction, the political polarization that is often taking place inside of families, the po polarization of the pandemic itself uh, and the vaccines and all those kinds of things. So, you know, you've, you've developed these techniques and, and given people these strategies. I'd like you to to give us a practicality here, because one of the things I've talked about with a lot of the leaders I'm working with is here's the deal. You know, you've, you've been screaming about wanting to go back to normal. A, I think normal sucked. And I think you've got to get over it because nothing goes back to normal. It's not how it works. There's an evolution. But anyway, let's say you get people back in the office and they go, okay, so how many employees you got? Well, let's say a thousand, right? We got a thousand. Great. So of the thousand people, who pre previously never really mentioned politics, how many of them do you think are now politically charged? Left or right, doesn't matter. Trump, ex, uh, you know, Trump lovers, Trump haters, doesn't matter, right? How many think of them are politically charged? And they go, well, probably a good percentage, right? And how many of them are probably going to speak about it? Not your 2% or 1% that spoke before. Now it's a lot of them. How do you bring these people together is always, how do you create a connection between people who are polarized about whatever the hell it is they're polarized about? Walk us through that connection piece, because I want to have our listeners, our viewers, get a real sense of here's a practical tool we can use to help bring people together and connect them. Hmm. Well, from a very, very high level, um, of course, granted, there's this very polarizing situation right now, but underlying that polarizing is layers upon layers of different stress factors that are going on. Yep. And we know that hurting people hurt people, right? Yep. So what we have to do is engage our hearts more than our brains. And we have to be able to pull those layers down to first of all, care for the person in front of us and try to understand what they've all been going through. Truly, we all underlying the political divisiveness have been suffering loss and uncertainty. We've been suffering from anxiety and depression. And when you really seek just to care for someone, like, like tell me, what have you been dealing with these last 18 months? Have your, has your life sucked as much as mine? <laughs> you know? And when you just break it down to that, um, you know, what happens is, is, you know, how our bodies are wired. We have this, this interplay between our hormones of oxytocin and cortisol, right? So these last 18 months have just dumped enormous amounts of cortisol in our system, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens when we're dumped with cortisol, so many things from emotional exhaustion, stress, and burnout, one of the key things are there is people are going to back away from relationships. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to isolate more so that when they are with people, it becomes more awkward again to engage. And then on top of that, as they're isolated, they're on these chat functions and spewing whatever they think about these things to let off steam. It's creating this culture that we have to bring people together to get to the core. I mean, because we can right now guarantee every single solitary person. I mean, unless you are some lucky, lucky one out there, everyone's dealing with something right now. Everyone, everyone's hurting, everyone's struggling. Everyone's uncertain. They don't know what the future is going to hold. Everyone goes to bed worried, scared, angry, or upset. 
And if we can just break it down that we know that if you want to maintain employees, think of what's going on with the big quit right now. Do you know why the big quit or the great resignation is happening? Is people don't feel valued. They don't mm-hmm. feel cared for. And so it is taking these situations and listening to people. And so you asked, how do you go about doing that? Mm-hmm. In my own company, we do it by four steps and we can dive into those steps later. First is we assess, we go in and we get a temperature reading. We do anonymous surveys, which really gauge the culture. And then we do personal assessments that each person gets a report back of their care behaviors that show what they're good at and what they're awkward at. Mm. Um, We take this aggregated and personalized data and we bring people back together into um, presentations and webinars to get a high level view again, of all the things we're talking about, why is this critical? Why do we have to know this? Mm -hmm. We know that our bodies are wired for this. This oxytocin is the only thing that's gonna offset that cortisol. But yet when you're full of cortisol, you back away from relationships. So we have to get back into understanding why this connectedness is so key. Um, so we, we do, we have then that presentation. So people understand why we're investing in this skill. The third step then is to equip. So we will take book and workshops, whatever, and take those assessments. And how does that look for you, the participant? What are your awkward behaviors? And we can get into that. We've identified, you know, 20 key behaviors that stop us from caring for one another. And then Mm. we help equip people with exactly what the strategies are to offset that. And we can dive into that because I find it fascinating. But then the last step is to cultivate. And so you need people within your organization then that are trained that can maintain this culture and maintain um, when things go wrong, not if, but when, because they always do that it's not just a check the box crisis response, but you have a long-term care response. And how can we make sure that people feel cared for? So we have an organizational training program that we will certify someone to stay within an organization um, to maintain that culture. Um, So that's how we go about doing it. So give us us one or two of these sort of awkward, uh, we wanna go into the, the practical on the other side in part two, and look at some of the behaviors we can do. But here, give us some of the the, the insights into what stops us. Because you said you've notified, uh-huh. I think, 20, you said. Um, right, right. Behaviors. Oh, it's fascinating, actually. I, I yeah. just love this stuff. But even before that, let's go. Let's look at the top two yeah. behaviors that I think I find fascinating. I know you're going to find this fascinating, too. So across the board that we've been doing this now for years, and we ask everyone to rate what they think they're good at. And then, you know, uh, obviously then how they react to situations across the board, age group, demographic, whatever people rate themselves highest on, I can see when someone's struggling, I always do number one. But then when we take, go to the anonymous pre-survey where we're gauging the culture and we ask, how do you feel cared for in these certain areas? The number one area where people feel uncared for, no one sees me when I struggle. Mm. Think about that, right? Yeah. Okay, so what do we have? I can see people when I'm struggling. I, the person, I, this is my number one care behavior, but yet no one sees me when I struggle. Mm. So why is that? Because people don't know how to show it. So, right. so or the issue, the they issue don't think is it's their place. That they're not actually. So are they not showing that they that they care, or are they mm-hmm. not showing that they're struggling, or both? <laughs> what do you think? Well, I, I think that people cover up. I think that people hide. They, you know, they put on the smiley face, and mm-hmm. everything's fine. You know, um, and people are expected to be psychic and try and work out what it is. And you're absolutely right. And and think about this in the remote environment too. It's so much easier because now you're not even seeing the nonverbal behaviors of your employees. So people are hiding it more and more, right? So if we dive into this awkward zone, um, 
I like to look at it as in two layers, right? Um, the first would be more of the mindset. You hear mm -hmm. of someone on your team or someone you know that's going through a difficult time. What is your initial reaction? Mm -hmm. And we find two different groups of people here. And, and again, neither of these are wrong. So we really encourage people, doesn't matter what your assessment says. It could be cultural, it could be whatever. But the one group is honestly, they just are ill-equipped. I don't know what to say and do. I'm afraid I'm gonna do the wrong thing. So I avoid it, right? The other group we will call more deflecting. It's mm -hmm. not my place. I don't wanna get involved. Someone else can do this better. I don't have time. Um, I'm burnt out enough. So you either have those that put me in coach if you show me how, or those that it's not, it's really not my place. Right. So each of those are different because again, if, if our goal is no matter what to show care to a person, look at the end of the day, you don't have to be someone's counselor, but you do have to make sure that person knows that you recognize and validate they're going through yes. a difficult time. So each of those groups require just a little different tools and strategies to understand how to make sure people see you as a caring leader. So in part two, I want to I want to address those two groups um, specifically because I think you're absolutely right that people are either going, yeah, it's none of my business, I don't want to put my foot in it, or I'd really like to do it, but I'm kind of a bit hand fisted with it and don't really know what to do. Um, so in part two, I really want to sort of so let's address those two groups and say, here's what you could do, and here's what you could do to just to make a start because I think you're absolutely right. The demand for for the unconscious demand, the unspoken demand, I should be clear, uh, the unspoken demand is that everybody is struggling in, in some way, shape, or form. And we as leaders have to be responsible and step up into that if we're going to ha have anything that resembles a healthy corporate culture and organization. Before we do that, because we're coming to the end here, um, I would love for you to tell people where they can find out more about you, about your book and about the resources. Um, and then we'll come back into part two. Yeah, thanks so much. Please visit inspiringcomfort.com. That again is inspiringcomfort.com where you can read all about our programs uh, and find the book. Fabulous. And of course, we'll make sure that we post all of the links uh, to Jen and to her work and her organization um, in the show notes too. So you'll be able to find them there. We're going to be back in just one click. So stay curious, my friend. Stay curious about how you can really deeply care effectively, not just with kindness, not just with empathy, but effectively care, show caring to others. We'll be back in just one click. See you on the other side.